Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, before I start speaking, I would just like to understand what the audience kind of knows about the things that I'm going to talk about. First, with the show of hands, please tell me if you've ever heard the story that HIV is a bioweapon or something along those lines. I mean, yeah? Okay. Most of you, most of the younger ones, which is interesting. Okay, so how many of you actually know that there is someone who has taken... Um, responsibility for it? None of you? Okay. Well, here's the story of how the HIV became a bioweapon uh, in the 80s, in the, in the late 80s, actually. In 1983, um, there, uh, supposedly a well-known American scientist, um, his newsletter was published in a small New Daily English language newspaper. Uh, the piece went on to review how the AIDS virus spreads how um, it, it develops, and that was done quite, accurate, quite ac accurately, actually. However, the author also claims that this was a bioweapon uh, aimed at minority groups that had basically gone out of control. This story f it took a few years, but successfully spread around the world, making headlines in popular and most of the times trusted media. Um, the US State Department took notice of this story and other similar stories and created a small, um, act, like a small working group uh, that was formed from a variety of agencies uh, which uh, aimed to kind of understand and learn more about how these stories spread, uh, who, what's the origin of them. Uh, and they figured out that these stories are what's known as active measure. This is a form of warfare that was conducted by the Soviet Union uh, to kind of deceive uh, pop the population of foreign countries through disinformation and propaganda. And while the US State Department and basically the entire Western world had small volunteering groups that have been working in spare time to counter this activity, the, the Soviet Union was uh, employing thousands of agents in all of the Soviet Union countries in order to think of the next he um, headline worthy uh, lie to disturb other nations. Here you can see a telegram uh, from the KGB, the Russian uh, uh, state security uh, organization, to the Bulgarian state security organization outlining this Operation Infection or how did they called it Operation Denver uh, disinformation campaign about the HIV. After the, um, the Active Measures Working Group uh, published a report on the Soviet Union disinformation campaigns in August 1987, uh, and also due to the first wave of cases of HIV in, this, in the Eastern Bloc, the Gorbachev government found itself in a lot of pressure both within and beyond the Iron Curtain. This led to him uh, basically apologizing to US officials later that same month um, and asking for vital intel on how to limit the uh, spread of the virus. Okay, uh, what does any of this have to do with uh, me being here? Well, after um, I uploaded a 30 minute video explaining how the COVID-19 vaccines work in Bulgarian, uh, which uh, is quite common for any aerospace engineering student to do, uh, I got invited to join a platform called Science in the Crisis that has been working uh, that has been promoting and analyzing anti-epidemic measures in my home country of Bulgaria and has been working with uh, authorities in order to create a um, uh, crisis communication strategy and also promote vaccination through working with general practitioners. Uh, one of the main government advisors had become a scapegoat in the political disinformation warfare in the 90s. Uh, she had been accused of bringing the HIV, uh, vi the HIV virus to Bulgaria, which she actually did, uh, but she did it to research the virus, not to infect people of it, as she was accused of. Uh, these accusa accusations were uh, found by some um, patriots, uh, you can, or better said, uh, creators and super spreaders of COVID misinformation, who used all of that information, all of these accusations to further harm the government's efforts in the fight against, the, against this information, against coronavirus, sorry. 
Basically, Bulgaria had many issues that led to the poor vaccination coverage. Uh, right now, it stands at about 30%, which is very bad. Uh, despite being warned for decades, probably, or more, the government had done very little to understand how disinformation behaves in the country, who funds such, such actions, who creates the content. Uh, little had been done to enable local uh, authorities to uh, kind of prevent healthcare professionals from spreading misinformation. Uh, because Bulgaria never really had any issues with uh, vaccination or any uh, mass anti-vax movements before. So there wasn't a need to enable the Ethics Committee of the Bulgarian uh, Medical Association, for example, to punish its members or discredit them or take away their licenses for spreading false information online or the media. So basically, every single day, we're having doctors come on uh, national television and just spreading the, the, the newest form of conspiracy about vaccines. Uh, and you can probably f like imagine what kind of an influence someone like Andrew Wakefield would have on the British society if he would appear every single day on BBC. And you might understand what's the issue with Bulgaria. And to top all, to top all of that, uh, we also had <laughs> elections. Uh, to add to the, to the uh, struggles and uh, suffering, uh, both for a president and a government, and uh, anti-vax campaigns actually brought otherwise unpopular parties into the National Assembly, which was very, very heartbreaking to see. It's still very interesting, however, how a disinformation campaign conducted 35 years ago still haunts not only Bulgaria, but many other countries. It's found in pop culture, young people in the room said, uh, that they actually have heard about this. Um, and yeah, this has been one of the most successful health-related conspiracies ever. So uh, how, do we, how, do we fight such, how do we fight such actions? How, what, what kind of things could we do to prevent uh, such conspiracy theories and disinformation rapidly spreading uh, throughout the world and throughout our communities? Well. Before we uh, kind of get into uh, the, the, how do we fight that, we should first kind of try to understand the, the issue at hand. Uh, one of the main issues with this information is the fact that it used to be something handed to governments, but now through social media, it's in the hands of, the, of everyone. Literally, we, we're living in a world where getting information out there is as easy as it gets. Um, and so we are susceptibly, we are increasingly more susceptible to disinformation uh, every single day. Um, and even forget about the health-related conspiracies. Forget about if, if you want conflicts and stuff. Disinformation divides us on crucial topics, from uh, politics and unions to how we respond to the climate crisis, what kinds of sectors are developed and supported, what kind of science is done. But as I said, I think there is a solution in the hands of the scientific community. Uh, some definitions are important because although disinformation became a household term uh, th during COVID-19 and especially right now with the Ukrainian conflict, there is some um, issues with uh, understanding definitions. First, of, first and foremost, uh, misinformation and disinformation are not synonymous. They're not the same. Misinformation may be done intentional, uh, and intentional, whereas disinformation is a deliberate act. Misinformation is most likely the, the result of poor journalism or lack of fact-checking, while disinformation requires skill and effort. Uh, the House of Commons uh, Select Committee on Culture, Media, and Sport uh, recognizes six uh, distinct types of uh, false information. Uh, disinformation most of the time comes in the form of three of those. That's fabric fabricated, manipulated, or imposter content. While fabricated content is a complete lie, that's not the main issue. The main issue is with manipulated content. That's when the truth is a little bit distorted, and if done right or to the right amount, literally anyone can fall uh, prey or fall victim to disinformation. So it's important to realize that all of us are all of the time being affected. Um, you might have had, by the way, um, been going through, so, through social media, finding a new news agency that popped out of nowhere, and have a very good content for a few, I guess, for a few days or a few, or for a few weeks or months. 
then all of a sudden it would just start posting questionable or clickbait content, basically anything misleading. Um, or you might find a, a good news agency that would out of nowhere just disappear. Most of the time, these kinds of news agencies are still out there. You're just not being targeted with the content that they're producing. Because targeting when it comes to um, disinformation is key. Um, basically, it's very important not to, uh, not to alienate people who kind of believe in conspiracy theories as well. Um, although it's sometimes hard, we have to recognize that this is just part of the information ecosystem that we live in. Because most of the times people who believe in this information are people that we love, people from our family and friends, uh, and sometimes they're extremely intelligent people otherwise. There are um, New York Times bestselling authors who believe that we did not land on the moon, which for me as an aerospace engineering student is kind of offensive. Uh, jokes aside, it's still, it, this, this goes to show that a lot of people can fall uh, victim to this information not because of their intelligence or their, uh, or, or their knowledge. This information is using a little bit of a different tactic. The tactic they're using is um, by purposely going, through, going to the things that we kind of uh, lack in our everyday lives, the things that make us suffer. Lies are sweet. Lies are easy. Lies often give us answers where there aren't any. Um, so this basically could be uh, attributed to something that, uh, that is called epistemic motivations. Uh, this is uh, called like that by, I'm not sure if it, oh, it's not here. It's called by Karen uh, Douglas. She's a, uh, she's a pr professor of um, so social psychology at the University of Kent. She also recognizes existential motivations. That's when human desires and, uh, and feelings are being targeted. You know, most of the times, lies are kind of sensational. They carry the element of surprise or disgust. And for social beings, they, they, there's ought to, there ought to be some social motivations. Lies, and this is especially true for conspiracy theories, often make us feel special. They make us feel superior to others, as if we have this access to this information that others just simply don't. Okay, so, but what does constitute a vulnerable person? Well, basically, lies and, and disinformation targets people uh, who suffer. Uh, it targets people who, are, who have some, some sort of issues in their life. Their bad experiences are being manipulated, are being used by uh, and manipulated by experienced creators of uh, disinformation uh, who then use those people, they turn those people from ordinary people into weapons against democracy and common sense. And you might well say, well, just can't we check our sources? I mean, it's not that hard. And yes, people initially are uh, kind of resistant to nonsense that comes with this information. The issue is that we cannot dissect all of the Facebook posts that find their ways to our news feeds. Basically, lies are everywhere. And it's very hard for our brains to um, be resistant all of the time. At some point, we unconsciously start to believe when whatever the content is. Uh, this is a um, media monitoring study done by our partners at the uh, Center for Analysis and Crisis Communications in Bulgaria. As you can clearly see by the red line, the amount of, uh, the, the amount of uh, negative tone that came towards the COVID-19 vaccines far outperforms any of the positive articles or, 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 neutral, uh, or articles with a neutral tone. And this became especially true as the elections were coming closer. As you can clearly see in November uh, of 2021, when we had our uh, elections, that's when the, uh, the negative tone, again, like the negative articles of, about vaccines were at, at their peak. Uh, and you might well ask, well, is this information then just simply a political tool? It sure can be. It has been used to assert chaos in foreign countries. It has been used to justify wars, to fuel paranoia, or justify uh, ethnic prejudice. The issue with that is, 
it's not done by just one country that we can just shut off. Um, although the Soviet Union has shown some information mist uh, mastery, and yeah, the Russian Federation sure keeps that um, tradition well alive, there are many Western countries who've also uh, been part of some form of disinformation campaign in the past. Examples about this are the USS Maine, a ship that was, that was sunken and uh, the belief that it was a Spanish torpedo hitting the ship uh, basically rallied the public to support the Spanish-American War. Then you have the fabricated uh, evidence that led to the Iraq War. Uh, you also, for example, have things like um, aspirin leading to uh, basically uh, the flu the pandemic of the 1918. Things that are just, you know that are lies, but have been used at, uh, throughout the time and are still being used today. Uh, last year, the most common uh, example of this, most recent example of this, is how uh, some Western <coughs> leaders actually um, used to say that COVID is a, is a bioweapon by the Chinese, that, and this led to um, a lot of uh, reports about increased violence against Asian minorities. So pretty much, this information is a persuasion tool. Um, it is used to break our value system, to divide us, to make us either uh, lose hope in societies and, and, and trust in institutions, or to either reaffirm our trust, depending on the context, depending which side your country is on or which country is your country uh, in that sense. So um, how do we then fight back? How do we fight this kind of persuasion that is now in the hands of literally anyone who has access to social media? Well, one thing that we learned from the Operation Infection or Operation Denver is the fact that no matter if you can actually debunk the claims, uh, there is still people who are going to hear about it, believe, believe in uh, whatever the claim was. Uh, so you can't really just try to um, kind of fix the origin or fix the, uh, the, the, the debunk the claim. That's a very late measure. Um, what you could do is you could try to be proactive about this. You could try to um, make sure that people don't, don't hear the disinformation first. Uh, debunking the claims is especially a big issue when it comes to vulnerable users who uh, are in so-called uh, echo chambers inside of um, uh, social media platforms in which they just only reaffirm their beliefs by talking to the same kind of people that they've already been talking to. So in order to fix that, we need to figure out a way to stop lies because lies, once they're being told, they grow a life of their own. People add to it, they make a stronger case. Uh, the lie sort of adapts to people. It mutates just like a virus. And I feel like most of us know the answer to what is the most effective tool against viruses. That is basically vaccination. So how do we vaccinate against disinformation? Well, I do believe that the, um, the academia uh, has a, a very good tool, it's a, it's a, or, it, or could be a very good tool to fight against disinformation. Because um, what's the main issue right now is a lot of the soon to be breakthroughs are hardly reflected in the media space. We talk about a whole new, uh, more efficient generation of batteries to support renewables. We're talking about new generation of, of drugs and vaccines. We're talking about new ways to treat cancer and superbugs. People freaked out about the COVID vaccines. Rem imagine what, what would happen once they actually learned that one of the most effective ways to treat superbugs is through introducing viruses into your body, through bacteriophages that are completely harmless to us, but wipe out the uh, half of the population of bacteria in a, in a, in a matter of day. Um, and so what, what could then the academia do? Well, they could be proactive by making sure that we hear the science first. First off, Universities uh, make vital contribution to the development of new technologies, of new ways, to, uh, of new medicines, uh, of, of basically the new world. Everything that, that comes 
as, a, um, um, as an improvement in, our, in the 21st century has, has set its uh, uh, past within the university. Uh, so basically, while the, the, uh, acad what the academia is doing their research, they could be supported by students because students hold an incredible amount of power to influence. Uh, you can, in, to like find a, a reason for that, you, you, you have to look no further than the growth of social media platforms such as TikTok. Uh, that, has com that has proven how uh, innovative people are in making compelling content. So instead of um, overflowing social media with uh, fear uh, and suffering, let's overflow it with um, a beacon of hope for a sustainable and a bright future. How will such a um, collaboration work? Well, while, univers while the university is conducting all of these kinds of research, students could have access and could be part of the, of the, of the research. They could uh, support it and then they could be tasked to create content, to share the ideas of that research, not the strides that are currently being made or the current approach, but your overall idea or what is supposed to be uh, the, the end result. So that people in, uh, in outside in the social media that are not part of any sort of research uh, could actually know what is there to come to change their life uh, in, a very, in, in the very soon future. Um, also, it's very important to uh, make sure, like, what will students and researchers gain? I, I forgot about to talk about that, but basically what they will gain is that researchers will have their work communicated while students will have some um, very valuable experience inside of a research area, a research field. They will 100% uh, get more and learn more about a certain subject by having a um, a hands-on experience more, more, more often, uh, and then uh, being able to just talk about the breakthroughs early on. Uh, that's something that all of us are going to gain. And universities should also make sure, it, and also the entire academia, should make sure that um, education is more accessible. Uh, online courses, clearly a good start, uh, but there are many different ways in which more people could be introduced to education. More people that go to university means more people who actually conduct research. Uh, we can get to, to the places we want humanity to be faster, uh, while also making sure that more people are there to talk about science and more people are there to talk about its breakthroughs and more people are there to silence uh, or overthrow the, the, the lies kingdom and um, make sure that we have actual information out there and not just blatant lies, and that just blatant lies just uh, fade into the void. I would like to leave you with this incredible render by SpaceX and their uh, starship, uh, spaceship, uh, at, the, at the rings of, of Saturn. Um, I think it's a very beautiful, um, it's a very beautiful picture. I want to see it in my lifetime being an actual image and not necessarily a, a render. And I want to, to leave you with a simple question. Um, is there a better story to tell than the story, than the true story of the universe? And probably better, is there a better story to tell than the story of the mankind in the universe? Because I believe we can achieve more if we work together. Uh, fighting this information, sure, requires a lot of effort and, and a lot of dedication. But if it comes to creating a world that we all believe in, that we all want to envision and we all, all want to create together, uh, it's, it's a necessary step to be taken. Thank you very much.